Welcome everyone here to the session of uh, the Drive Conference. Um, uh, it's been uh, a great conference so far. I hope you've had a great time yesterday and, and today as well and can take back. You can turn it off. off. You want to <laughs> we, st we still kind of want it on a little bit and have a good time. We're going to bring in some, uh, some mimosas and, and some other stuff, but the Hyatt said no. Uh, anyway, I hope you've had a great time. My name is Matt. I'm the room host. If you need anything, come see me or anyone affiliated with the University of Washington and we can help you out. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Christine Vo of CVO. Uh, Christine is a freelance digital designer with more than seven years of interactive design experience and seven years of UX experience. She has worked for industry leaders including Google, Old Spice, Nike, Levi's, Intel, Career Builder, and many more. Uh, she has worked her work has been recognized in the Webby Awards, Rosie Awards, and Favorite Website Awards. Uh, she also lends her creative talents and entrepreneurial skills uh, to helping the less fortunate in remote parts of the world. Um, uh, I've got the chance to know Christine over the last couple days, and she's a good friend of my good friend, Chris Sorensen, and he vouches for her amazing design skills. And from what I've seen, she's uh, an excellent designer. She's going to kill me when I tell you this, and this might age her and maybe some of you, but in high school, she uh, actually photoshopped her braces out um, because uh, she was in high school when there was Photoshop. And she's been working on Photoshop um, uh, since she was very young. And uh, with that, let's, let's give uh, Christine a warm drive welcome. First of all, there's a lot more people than I thought was going to come to this thing, so bear with me. Um, my name is Christine Vo, and I am a digital designer. Um, I'm based here in Seattle. I actually just moved here just about six, six months ago from Portland. I was out there for about eight years. Um, I went to school there, and then I started the industry uh, there in design. Um, so what exactly is digital design? Uh, that is what we're here to talk about, right? So, let me focus on this. Well, actually, first of all, <laughs> before we get there, <laughs> a little bit, uh, just a kind of a tangent here. Um, nothing ruins Friday like realizing it's only Wednesday. Uh, I know today is the second day, the last day of the conference, and it feels like, pretty much it feels like Friday because we can go and celebrate tonight, but maybe not. Um, so, but at the end of the day, this is going to be all good, um, I hope. So uh, Dory has a very special place in my heart, and I can't wait until the movie comes out. All right, so back to business. Digital design. What is digital design? It is the practice of creative, or the practice of crafting the overall look and feel of a wide range of interactive communication experience, such as websites, mobile tablets, uh, television, etc. Who here has a smartphone? Who here has a tablet? That's a lot of you, right? Who here watches TV anymore? <laughs> All right, so you guys, you must be bored. Um, <laughs> okay, so those interfaces is what I focus on on a day-to-day -day basis. I think through basically how are people going to interact with these different applications and experiences. Um, just to give you kind of like one on like uh, experiences for you guys, like. Your kitchen, everybody has a kitchen, I hope, right? Um, think about the way that you arranged the kitchen. Think about where you put the bowls, where you put the cups, forks and spoons, right? I'm assuming you're gonna put your cups somewhere near the water. I'm assuming you're gonna put your pots and pans somewhere near your oven, right? So that's the type of thinking that I do through a website and um, an application. Good design is thorough, down to the last detail. This statement couldn't be any more true. I think that um, in order to make something really from a, a decent you know, experience into something that is really actually good and meaningful and useful to a user, um, you must, you have to have to think about the details. It's all the little details that make all the difference in the world. This thing. This thing, I remember, I just, I was on a trip, a business trip to Minneapolis, and on my way back, walking out of the tunnel of the, uh, the terminal tunnel, um, I literally, from the corner of my eye, I was like, what, what is that thing over there? And 
I was really, really excited because I'm like, whatever it is I have to get over there, I have to go and see what this thing was. And I remember I was just, I had to get there fast, no matter how many people were walking through, but like between me and this thing, um, I had to get there. Um, the closer that I got, the more excited I got about the product, and I was just like, this must be like love at first sight. I wish I even saw a guy who I could look at it, this thing the way that I, you know? <laughs> and um, I remember the moment I walked up, this thing was sitting on the, the, the Bose um, stand just like this by itself, right? I walk up to it and I'm just like, I have, I have to see what this thing is. Like I have to see, I have this old one, the older version. I've had this thing for a couple years. I had this thing and I love this thing because I'm constantly listening to music everywhere I go. I'm constantly thinking about how do I entertain the people around me? How do I make playing sports a little bit more fun, you know? Music can always fix all that. Like, I had it playing here. I felt like actually it wasn't loud enough, but then I didn't want to disturb you guys up here. Um, but I saw this thing and I was just so just thrilled by the fact that they had put this thing together. Um, just to think about the patterns that they use in the front here. Um, to think about all the, the seams and the way that things, this thing folds, the way that the detail of this, this piece, it acts as the brand itself, but also the tag for you to be able to pull and also fold back like this into a seamless device that sits on its own just like that, right? Let me show you what it was before. Same thing, the brand here, you pull and you get a stand, but just that simple detail of changing this into the half and turning it into something that sits on its own with just that slightly of a detail change. I thought that was like incredible. And I think th those are the things that make this thing okay, this is cool, this thing works, to wow, like this is amazing, the color, the, the leather, the way that everything just fits together and um, all that got me really, really excited. And it's 11.20, you guys, so. Um, All right. Oh, we can see one. Okay, so all of those details that I mentioned earlier about the Bose speakers, all of the different principles and the design thinking behind all that really pulls through not only in the industrial design side, but also into our daily experiences. Um, take, for example, Alaska versus Virgin Airlines. Who here flew from somewhere else? Uh, <laughs> All right, so who flew out Alaska? Anybody fly with Virgin? No? <laughs> All right, so this is a really clear example also of just the differences between paying attention to those design things. And um, with Alaska, you know, they have the basic seats, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go, I just need to get to where I need to be. Um, give me some leg room and a comfy seat just for a couple hours or maybe 10 hours, whatever it is. And then you see over at Virgin, they, their design team really, really paid attention to how they want their customers to feel the moment that they reach the brand. Virgin is a very, very, they're, they're notorious for being the fun, lively, young, exuberant brand that we, they wanted to take that into their whole experience from the moment you walk up to those counters and talk to the people the moment you get up to the kiosk to get your, your ticket. And then after that, walking through all the way to the, uh, your actual gate, the people there are just so much more friendlier from what I've noticed. And then the moment you walk in the airplane, it's like a nightclub in there, you know? All that I think really makes something that used to be really maybe a nerve wracking thing for someone into something that is actually really exciting through the process, not only to get excited about the destination itself. I hope you guys have discovered paperless uh, <laughs> statements. Um, just eight years ago, Mint came out with their idea of being able to consolidate all of your bank statements and uh, transactions into one place. And the, this whole idea was super like revolutionary. Like everybody wants to be better at tracking their money. Everybody wants to be more, like t to save more, to be able to, um, understand how they spend their money more. And when Mint came out with this, they said, hey, 
I don't care however many bank accounts you have, all you need to do is give me your login information, your bank account information, and then we'll do the rest, right? So what they did was exactly that. As you can see, instead of having to sift through a ton of papers now and trying to find the actual transaction of when I went to dinner the other day, now I can just go here and I can um, search for all of my Starbucks transactions to see how much I spent on coffee that, that month or maybe that year. Um, this is another key thing about design and it, it's, it's one of those things where, as you see, it goes in from industrial design all the way through to the experience in itself with your flights and now to your actual devices. Um, and this is what makes the world go around, I guess. Um, this is the kind of thing that we as designers, um, at least for me, what gets me so excited about it is that I constantly get to help you guys make your lives better every day, however that may be. Um, and that, that really gets me really, really excited. We can skip that. Okay, so I know you guys are all really into data, and I, I was in some of the conferences yesterday, and um, a lot of it honestly went over my head, and it was very technical. But uh, I wanted to take you through this experience because um, Apple just recently launched this timeline, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with it at all, but I think this is a great example of showing the way that Apple has used all of their data, aggregated all of their data from all the 30 years about the Mac PC into one window, just like this. All right, so I think that was just like a couple months ago they launched this. And as you can see, like just the interactions and the storytelling behind everything that has happened throughout the 30 years, and then also to integrate some of the data that goes behind how people used it. And to think about all, like taking all of these elements in to be able to decipher it in a way and organize it in a way where you guys would find interest in what's going on, um, what had happened during that year, what was so significant about the changes that had happened throughout those years. And in what I do in the digital world, those, the, the little things like that is what makes an experience from good to great. Um, those are the things that make an experience from super static and boring into something much more in, immersive and something much more engaging. These little rollovers, the way that photos come in, the navigation is very important. You want to make sure that people know where they're going. Just overall, a really, really amazing piece. And the photography and everything is just curated beautifully. Um. Okay. So I'm, I'm not sure, actually I don't think anybody knows, but I was uh, the design director for all of the um, Drive Conference and Michelangelo stuff that you saw. Um, these things, the students who worked on this, were, they were incredible. Um, they did, I thought they did an amazing job at putting this together. Um, one for each day, right? And this serves a purpose and that is to make sure that you guys know where you're going and what's going on for the day, right? Um, this is a very important part of the, the puzzle. Um, I would like to talk to you about just the process and how it all came together so that you can understand how designers work with all the different players in the game, right? Um, so taking it back to just a month ago, Chris called me and I don't know if you guys know Chris uh, very well, but the guy is like a walking, talking ball of energy. And the moment that I see this guy, all I, can, all I can think is whatever it is that he has to talk to me about, I don't even care, let's do it, you know? Like, let's make sure that we get it done in whatever time frame that you have and call it, call it good. Um, I'm here for you, right? So these are the two websites that we put together. Um, I think you guys are all familiar with the Drive site and uh, Michelangelo is his product and um, he, he came to me and he said, hey, I need these two websites revamped. They're really dated, they don't really do what I needed to do 
and I need you to make it so that it's something that really excites the people who are about to go to this conference. A place where people can go and actually get all the information that they need and understand that this is everything that's going on and be able to get all the information um, for not only maybe for them, but also to share it to other people, right? So that's number one, that's for Drive. Michelangelo, um, I also got to work on the branding and all that stuff for these two. So um, he wanted to make sure that these two sites also not only existed as its own brand, but also came together as a family as well because of the connections that they had with each other. So in the details of what we decided, like all in the meantime, all this stuff was happening. So let me also describe to you, this is kind of like the little mini ecosystem of the process and the, the different people who were involved. Um, everybody had to play together so well, like everybody had to move together and sync with each other all the time to make sure that we were providing each other with the right information at the right time and providing this environment that people, these people could be able to do their job and not feel one, they want to make, we want to empower them to make sure that they can do their job. We don't want to create roadblocks to where they're like, oh, well, I can't do this because of the content. I can't do this because, you know, the design's not done. I can't do this because of this and this and this, right? So luckily, like, the team that Chris and I had been able to bring together for it, like, in these two sites, if it was ideal, if we had the, our choice, we would have liked at least, like, maybe three to five months to be able to do both design and development. We had to do it in one month, both design and development. And so that in itself, I think, also brings up realities of the whole industry is that people are always constantly saying, we want this, we want that, but we need it in a week, or we needed it yesterday. So how do we, as designers and developers, figure out how to do things efficiently? How do we decide what is gonna go on the site and what's not? What functions and feature uh, features are we going to approve and which are we not, right? So here's the team. There's Chris and I who are always constantly talking to figure out and make sure that Chris is very happy with what we're about to produce. And then behind the scenes, we also have our designer, our two developers, one of which is, is Colin right there. He did the Michelangelo site. And then on Chris's side, he's got Tim, Machiko, and Kareen, who are the dream team on that side. And all of the communication between Tim and I, and then Chris and I, and then the developers to make sure that they know what they're doing so that both sites are gonna go and sync with each other. Once, once we leave, we need to make sure that the drive team knows how to go back and update the site and like understand how to really make changes and um, keep it up to date. And I can't stress enough that it's so important to build a really, really strong team in the process of doing all of this. Um, to be able to pull together what we did in a, a month is actually pretty incredible. And like, not only is it fully functional on a website or on a desktop, but also once you scale it down for a tablet and also for your mobile phone and everything, it works uh, really well too. A quick overview of the process of creating a website. Um, it starts out with a site map. The site map is where you learn about what it is that's going to go on in the site. What do we want to communicate to the people and how do we layer those? How do we um, make it so that the users can peel off those layers and get to what they really need, right? From there, we take it into the wireframe stages and um, the wireframes is really starting to organize all those pieces together. Then after that, we start thinking about what is this thing gonna look like? How are we going to make sure that both Michelangelo and Drive are gonna be similar as a family, but also be able to exist on its own as a strong brand. So just um, here, what we decided was you know, here's Drive's brand. It's a little bit more modern, but it has kind of like that classic look with the serifs and all that stuff. But then Michelangelo is super, super like Michelangelo, you know? You, you know exactly what that is. And so how do we make sure that those things come together? What we did was um, one of the main things was for Drive, the main primary color is gonna be the green. Michelangelo is gonna be the red, right? 
And those small nuances make a big difference in the experience and also in the design language in itself. Um, okay, so then um, after you create the look and feel, uh, you then also, well, in this particular scenario, we basically did the look and feel and then once the first comp was uh, approved due to the timeline, um, we sent that file over to Derek, our developer, at least for Drive, and then he started developing all the, while we were also designing the rest of the pages out. Colin over here, he, I had to call him like a week left uh, of, before the launch date, and I was like, Colin, I really need your help. Um, I have a week and I really need to get this website up, and he happily took on the job, so thank you for that. Um, otherwise, you guys would have gotten stuck with the other website. Okay, so I'm, how are we doing on time? I, okay, cool. So I'm gonna give you guys an option. <laughs> One, you guys can ask me questions so you can really know, like get to know whatever you guys wanna know or I can go through a little bit of what I've done in the past. Questions? Who wants questions? Okay. How, so your question was, how do you manage the process and how do you make sure you know? How do you manage people who are saying, this isn't complete, you're going to have to think a little bit, you're going to have to think about it first. How do you manage that whole process to make it something that's not good? Okay, got you. So the question was, how do, you, how do you make sure that when you give a file that is not necessarily complete or you're in a process that's not com complete, how do you make sure that things still come together, right? So this is all down to the team. Um, I am lucky to have developers like Colin and Derek on my team where they not only do the coding side, but they're also very intuitive on the design side too. So I trust them fully with whenever I send them a file and I'm like, hey, look, this is really the look and feel that we want. This is all the functions that we need. Do it as pixel perfect as you can, but at the same time, like, please put your design hat on as well and then make the best decisions for what you feel will come next. This is what, I, this is what you're gonna get in a couple days. I kind of lay it out for them so that they understand what to expect and then they build from, from that expectation to prepare for what's to come. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think that's a very um, that's a very typical s scenario. But then at the same time, at least for me, this is also the contrasting difference between why I don't like to work for big, bigger companies is that you get stuck in that like too many cooks in the kitchen. You can't make a decision. Um, at some point, I think it just comes down to the fact that you know we need to get this thing out there. If you never, it's better to have something than nothing, right? So I would rather be able to put something out there that I know is at least decent or does the job or is good, and then I can always get feedback and then slowly build upon that. It's better to do that than not to have anything at all, so that because how are people really going to know where to go from there, right? So, hey, Seth. Hey. Um, so two related questions. Sure. We're actually all remote. For this, this particular project in itself, like I'm in Seattle, Colin and Derek are in Portland. Um, our designer is in Seattle, and then the rest are at UW. So to that end, can you talk a little bit about the tools you're using to collaborate with your team and manage the process flow, and also give design feedback to your team? Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Sure, of course. Um, email? <laughs> so actually, maybe this is not the best project to talk about in that um, I'm currently working with a client in Australia right now, and obviously we've, we haven't even met yet, but the way that we communicate our concepts and our ideas and talk through things is through Skype. 
Um, Skype is a really awesome thing. Google Hangout is also a new, another really powerful tool. Um, being able to screen share and talk through your ideas. And you know, luckily, because uh, I know how to use Illustrator and stuff like that, a lot of times when I do the screen share, I can also take people through the design process just by illustrating it while I talk about it. Um, so that is really, I mean, those are the two keys. Um, uh, Basecamp. I use Basecamp on occasion. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of like, I, I tend to like to build my own as well. And so like, again, it's just more because I'm, it, I want it to be catered to me. So um, sometimes I hack Google Docs and stuff together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you go through the design process, um, what are the challenges in maintaining the standardized layout? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think so. so. The question was, how do you um, how do you figure out when to use standard practices and when not to, right? Yeah. Some websites like Stackdriver Puzzle. Right. Yeah. 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 Actually, that's really funny that you bring that up because uh, Widening Kennedy's old site was exactly that. Like it was like this really janky like um, space cadet like a bunch of stars in the universe and then you click and you try to dive into what's going on. But that was the days where, you know, you're right, like stuff like Flash was out there and there was really no structure behind a usability um, testing in a sense. Um, it was more to see something cool. Nowadays, people want to see cool things but also they want to be able to understand what they're doing and um, people are also much more ADD and scatterbrained and so um, you want to make sure that you organize the information uh, in a clear way, and I think those standard practices is like menu on the top, menu on the left, you know. Um, but um, as the evolution of uh, the digital world happens, I think people become more used to the different changes that could happen, and they like say, for example, a lot of sites now instead of having the actual menu um, up here, they just have like the hamburger they call it, um, which is the three lines or whatever it is on the left that indicates that that's your menu. And they, they, people are just fine with that. Um, there's always people who are going to be like, well, that's shitty. I don't understand that, but whatever, you know. Um, but it's the, taking those risks. I think as designers, you take those risks to see how people react to that. You, you do those to, to see how far you can push them and then scale back from there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, meaning, how do I work with clients who push things back on me? So that means bad. bad. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> good question. You talk to them very nicely <laughs> and uh, find, instead of um, saying, no, I think that's a bad idea, I think it's explaining to them and talking them through what it is that they're trying to, to have me do, right? And then helping them find and talk through those solutions that could be better. Um, again, WK.com was a two-year project for me from start to finish, and I remember they took me through hell. I remember it was just really bad. They kept on having me do all these things that were totally not in practices at all, like the standards in web, but you had to go through those motions so that they understand what it is that web is and what it is that best practices is in, in this kind of world. Yeah? So a similar question to that is how about like ill-defined definitions of what they're wanting to be in that mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like a lot of our tech projects we run into, what, what you really come up against when you start to throw out what best practices is that people haven't had the difficult conversation to decide what to keep and what to get rid of. And so no matter how well designed it is, it's just right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question was how do you um, scale down all of the information that you have and how do you figure out what it is that you want to share um, on your interface or uh, product, right? Um, I think that's why, where UX comes in, the user experience side, and that's where um, they do all the research and um, 
heuristic uh, research and all that stuff so that they could figure out who it is we're talking to, right? And then once you figure all that out, um, you then start putting all the rest of the pieces together around it that will make the most sense for the scenario in itself. So say for example, like um, with Michelangelo, it's, it's one of those things where it's like we have one month, we don't have the final content for um, so this page is this page and this page. So at what point do we decide, we'll leave this for later on, right? And I think um, a lot of that, for me, when it comes to working with a client, I, I help them talk through it, but at the same time, um, they really are the ones who are the brains behind it all. And um, at the end of the day, I think they're the ones who really have to make that decision. And as a designer, we just kind of help them talk through it and understand what it is that they're really trying to do. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. what's, what's next? Um, good question. I wish I went to CES to tell you more. <laughs> um, you know, I I keep seeing those it, the experiences where you got these things and like you know with the Google Glass and seeing things project and then like with a BMW cars projecting maps and stuff to their windows. I. There's something that I think I've always said um, as a designer, and I, I've worked in those uh, industries where all they think about is the future, right? And there's something really cool about that, but at the same time, like, I'm just like, but it's not so realistic, you know? I, I would love to know if my milk is running out in my fridge so that it notifies me in my phone, but at the same time, when is when are people really actually going to use that? Um, so I guess like I I wish I could tell you something really revolutionary and cool and stuff like that, but um, I think I don't know. Maybe what I'd like to see I guess is like um, actually Apple just uh, announced that they are going to start integrating their um, interfaces into cars, and that that gets me really excited. Um, so usability and all that stuff is going to be much more seamless and all that stuff. That gets, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. As a designer, what are some of the challenges you have when you're trying to deal with um, varying resolutions, varying devices? Mm -hmm. is, uh, can you, is it, how, how complex does it become the design process uh, trying to think of how to handle all the different ways that layouts can happen? Right. Question. The question was, how do you handle all of the different interface sizes? Um, and how, as a designer, how do you manage figuring out how to um, make sure that it fits in all the different mediums that you have? Um, you know, I, I guess I get really excited about it. And I get excited about all the different challenges that each device size um, brings. And it's become a standard. Um, and it's just something that you also have to integrate and factor in in your timeline and uh, make sure that um, Everything that we do, we make sure that all the interactions and everything um, will translate well to the touch devices. Um, I know when Colin and I were working together, we, uh, our philosophy behind design was to start with the, the tablet um, because that's, that's where people are most of the time nowadays. So instead of doing a lot of rollovers and stuff like that, now eliminate all the rollovers. We don't want to do anything with that. And now it's how do we make this experience really immersive and fun for people? Um, and so I guess it's just really making sure that you factor in the, all that. Yeah. Are you using responsive framework? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Bootstrap three from Michelangelo, and then uh, Derek used something called Foundation five, which is which is pretty similar. And I can talk more about the code inside of it if anybody wants to talk about that. So. A lot of da data stuff, that guy right there, too. He's built a lot of really cool things. Yeah, hi. Can you talk a little bit about how you choose color for a client who doesn't already have a brand color? Or if you're doing yeah. any kind of visualizations or graphs, do you go back to like what we learned in art school or what I learned in art school about like colors? you know, purple being the regal color and that coast kind of personalities or is there kind of something newer that you use to? 
Huh. Okay. How do I go about finding a color? Um, Why do you choose brown for a drive, for example? Um, oh, actually, so drive, uh, Chris really wanted something that was really classic and um, took back to those days of Michelangelo. And uh, with that, I think you start to think of those more muted colors, more classic um, conservative colors in a sense. And so that's actually why we chose the green and the red to integrate in because we wanted to also bring it to the modern days. And um, having those two, three colors play together, I think seemed to work out really well for the two brands. Yeah. Yeah. How do I summarize that question? <laughs> for the greater good. So the question was, do you go for uh, the lower, lowest common denominator or do you go for the grand, um, everybody, we want to focus on everybody to be able to use it? Um, it depends on what it is we're doing. Say for example, um, this is a good example. Taking back to, let's say oldspice.com in comparison to a wk.com. wk.com, think about the market who's going to this. It's all the people in marketing, all the people who have probably a Mac somewhere, right? Um, and then you think about a place like Old Spice where it opens it up to anybody. Um, it could be my nephew, it could be my dad. That's a really big range. Um, when we designed for WK.com, because of the fact that we assume that everybody has a Mac, we assume that everybody has an Apple product of some sort, we didn't have to think about the PC very much. Um, it was just something that we sacrificed and we felt like we didn't need to cater to that. Um, and this happens actually all the time um, in considering those two things. And when you deal with an, like, a client like Old Spice, you want to make sure that people from all the different types of devices from all over the world can access this thing. And so you, you decide whether you want to make sure that it's going to work on an um, explorer, uh, that it's going to work on Firefox and all that stuff. And then uh, we would communicate what, that with a developer and make sure that uh, they integrate that line of code um, or whatnot into the experience so that um, nobody gets left behind in a sense. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Um, can, you, can you maybe give us an experience early on in your career for that back then? Sure. Story about the challenge or Sure. So the question was um, could, you, could I tell you guys a little bit more about uh, the my career and my earlier stages and um, the challenges I, I have faced and how I overcame it. Um, when I, I actually, so I started out working at Wyden um, straight out of school. I graduated on a Friday and they called me and had me come in and work on Monday. And Wyden and Kennedy is one of those agencies where uh, it's one of those places where you couldn't even touch them. Like as a student, it was just really, really intimidating to think of um, even going there to talk to anybody there because everybody always told me that um, you had to have at least like most people there had to have at least 10 5 to 10 year experience to even get into that agency and um, so honestly I never really networked there and I, I'm a huge networking freak like I'm constantly out there just meeting people and connecting with people and um, the fact that I even got in there was ridiculous I, I think the guy who came and found me was he, like left his glasses behind or something like that um, when he saw my portfolio at school. But um, I, I remember when I first got there, they actually asked me to come and work on S Starbucks. And literally the day that I got there to start my job, they had an agency meeting and they said, we're firing Starbucks. I was sitting, I was like literally standing there, I'm like, 
All right, so uh, it's nice to meet you, Wyden and Kennedy. I guess I will see you guys later. Um, but luckily, my de design director at the time, he ended up uh, putting me on a new project, and that was OldSpice.com. Some, uh, <laughs> some truth to come out. Um, the first thing he asked me to do was create wireframes to figure out what this website was going to be. And I have never done a single wireframe ever in my life. Um, I've only gone straight to design. And I had, to, I had to figure out a way to make sure that like, he didn't know that I didn't know what the heck wireframes were. And I literally went back to my desk and I was like, Google, what is a wireframe? <laughs> I looked that up and it was just a bunch of gray boxes and all that stuff. And uh, I was like, all right, all right, I think I could do this. Um, and so, you know, I think having gone through this experience where you go into a situation where you have no idea what the hell you're doing and um, you really have nowhere else to go but to figure it out on your own uh, really, really taught me that um, if you put your mind to something, no matter what it is, uh, there's always a way if, you know, um, there's a will. And um, I remember the first meeting going in to talk to him about my designs or my wires. I was just like, ah, I don't know if I'm doing this right. Um, but this is what I think Old Spice should be. What do you think about like a hero page or a hero here and then maybe putting some products here and things like that. And um, it was all good. Uh, I kept my job. <laughs> um, and I, that in itself, I think, you know, coming into a place like that, being the youngest at the agency for however many, like maybe a year or something like that. Um, I don't even think they knew I was the youngest, but um, I was barely 21 and they, uh, they were very excited um, about the things that I had to bring. And I think being in the digital world too, um, being younger and like having lived through just the evolution of how all of the technology has changed and you know, being the ones who are really the users of all of these things um, has given me leverage to be able to dictate what could happen next because you understand, you know, what it is that the market is looking for. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess the rest was history. It's been crazy how many, how much, how fast time has flown and um, I feel very, actually very lucky to be here too. Like, I was telling Chris I was so nervous. Oh, everybody on the team knew I was so nervous today. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks. Yeah? Yeah. Um, do I need to repeat that question? No. Okay, cool. So, um, how do you go back and tell them and convince them that design should be considered in whatever it is that you're building? Um, I think if you gave examples of what I gave today, <laughs> would kind of give them, start planting the seed that like, you know, we really need to start thinking about how we communicate our ideas and communicate our product to people and start thinking about who we are as a brand, who, who you are as a brand, and who you want to be in front of other people's eyes, right? Um, that's very, very crucial in the longevity of the company and um, the longevity of how uh, the image that you want to share with others. And um, I think, you know, touching on the question about hiring on a freelancer or a, uh, a company, I am a contractor, so I am very biased. Uh, what I say to my clients is, um, when you work with a freelancer, of, of course it has to be, you gotta make sure they're somebody who's knowledgeable both in the business world, but also in what they do, right? Um, when you deal with a freelancer, normally they should be a lot more flexible. They should be able to listen to you and um, understand what it is that you're looking for and paint that picture for you into reality. Um, I think, when you work with a comp like a bigger organization, a lot of times you have to deal with the politics. You have to deal with just you know all of these different people and all the different players that go into it. Where they may not be necessary. Like when you go into a room, if there's like ten people in there, there's I honestly kind of I 
don't like those type of scenarios because then you don't really get to focus on the work. You start having to deal with like, oh, well, this person said this. We wanted this, this button in there, but we can't get it. Um, and it's a lot of friction, a lot of pulling back and forth. And I think, you know, I think maybe that's something that Chris uh, really enjoyed about working um, with me just as an individual. Uh, it was really, really quick to be able to make a decision. It was really, really quick to be able to talk through a problem and figure out where we should take it from there. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, hey. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Do you recognize, um, for this mostly academic crowd, where the opportunities are in the coming years for design to play a role in improving and differentiating any aspect of academic life, universities, mm -hmm. admissions, fundraising, things like that? Where, where can design play a role in improving all those situations? Where can design play in improving the academic Experience. I thank you for asking that question. Actually, um, I think there's a lot of uh, like one of the biggest things for me is um, thinking. I know I remember going through school like everything that the school. I went to the art institute, so it's not really a big school. But to think of the process of how I scheduled my classes, <coughs> where I had to go to get faculty information. How being new to a school, um, being new to a different location, being new to everything pretty much once you enter um, college years, I think it would be great. It would be really, really cool if there was one central place where I can go and get my information. Like absolutely, if I came to the school and one of the services that they provided me was, hey, we've made it so easy for you to get used to this life that Everything is here on your screen, whatever it is, my phone, my tablet, or whatever. Um, you can create your schedule here. You can communicate with your teachers here. There's a whole bunch of restaurants and um, different activities and stuff around here. You can get all that information from this application or whatever it is that you want to build. Um, I think that in itself will also drive not only a better experience for your students, but also give opportunities to those who are involved around you, um, the campus and everything. So like money driving revenues, blah, 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 all that stuff. I think the fact that being able to aggregate all of this content, talking about data, being able to aggregate all of these different elements into one place um, that'll make it easier for your students and your faculty um, and your parents to really understand and um, be in sync with each other, I think would be really, really awesome one day. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah? Uh, it's okay if you've never had one of these clients, but I wonder if you have a specific example of a client where the, the design requirement was to, to cater to um, less tech savvy, less uh, uh, yeah, tech savvy. Have I, or yeah, just to repeat your question, have I ever had to deal with a client that was not very tech savvy? Or, or that had decisions that they expected. Okay. Um, good question. Would Cascade be one? I alert. Oh, okay. All right, one. <laughs> so all, uh, Colin and I worked on a product called iAlert. Um, actually, it was his, it's his product. Um, iAlert is a, how would, how would you summarize it? Yeah, so basically what that means is, in my head as a user, user experience and designer um, is, who's gonna be touching this? It's gonna be a bunch of nurses, a bunch of, um, doctors maybe, people who don't necessarily live in the technical world at all. They're there to just save lives. <laughs> and um, they're basically going from a pager to now using a smartphone, right? So the, the platform itself is um, used through your iPod, iPad or iPhone. And so 
I think what helps in that scenario is that iPhones and they're pretty standard and they're pretty intuitive and so now it's like how do we make sure that the interface on the phone is going to be really really simple for people right so there's a difference between building something really simple and easy for someone to just quickly understand like I want my niece to be able to play this you know um, to make it that simple and then also then there's the opposite where you're dealing with people who know exactly what tech, like everything, the usability, how these devices work. You can get a little bit more um, experimental with that. And then you can start throwing in those like curveballs and seeing what they do with that. But when you deal with those kind of scenarios, I think it's just really dumbing it down to make sure that it's as simple as possible for people. No questions asked. Don't even think about it. You know exactly what you're doing. Yeah. It's time for lunch, so let's thank Christine. Thanks, guys.